<sighs> Here we go. Okay, ready for another round of Astro Babble. Oh no, my water. Okay, here we go. Just kidding. Must have hydration for this. Good morning. So uh, we are here for the Astro Babble. Uh, we've got eight more charts that everybody has lovingly donated. Thank you so much for your continued support of the live streams. I appreciate you very much. Um, we are going to do these eight charts. I've run them in my Solar Fire Astro software, and we're basically just going to talk about what I see, talk about some basic astrology stuff, some advanced astrology stuff, give you all a little taste of what it's like to have a consultation. And if you would like to book a consult or check out some of my online classes, just go to ScorpioRisingAstrology.com. If you would like to be a part of the, the live stream, just send me your birth date, place an exact birth time, spell out the month and day for me for all of you overseas and um yeah i do need that exact birth time and we will we'll get to it so good morning everybody let's let's pull up our first chart so we have ashna ashna was born 5 27 p.m in rotterdam rotterdam yes Ooh, that's a that's a big old stellium oh goodness so we've got the Ascendant in Gemini, and we've got the Moon in Gemini, kind of a carryover theme from, from yesterday. Uh, so when we have two of the three primary astrological markers for personality, the Sun, the Moon, or the Ascendant in the same sign, here we have both the Moon and the Ascendant in Gemini, this make, makes Ashna a double Gemini, which is also very confusing because her Sun sign is a part of the Sagittarius stellium in the seventh house. What does this mean? A lot of clients will ask me, Sam, you know, you say that my ascendant is in this sign and you say that my moon is in this sign and uh, sun is in this sign. And I've been reading for my sun sign the whole time, but especially in Ashna's chart, what we're looking at right now, she has her moon and her ascendant in Gemini, which makes her a double Gemini. So she should really be reading for Gemini, not necessarily her sun sign of Sagittarius, although her Mercury is in Sagittarius as well in this crazy pile up in her seventh house where we have Uranus, Sun, Mercury, Venus, Neptune, all in Sagittarius, all in the seventh house of relationships. Very interesting, Ashna. Um, also interesting, we have a Mercury and Venus conjunction at 15 degrees in that seventh house. So one of the things that you'll be looking for in a partner is a very, very quick mind, somebody who's uh, continuously optimistic, always striving to see the good in people, um, almost to a fault. Sagittarius is one of those signs that tends to be a little bit uh, toxically positive is a, a good way to think about it. Um, instead of facing the facts, they would prefer to just live in their their higher ideal of the white picket fence, which is not nothing wrong with that, but that's, that's just something that I see a lot. When we have the moon and the ascendant naturally opposed uh, to the ruler of the chart, like we have in Ashna's chart, there's this conflict between the the actual self represented by the ascendant and the moon, the emotional self, versus where we put ourselves. And she's put the ruler of her chart in that seventh house of relationships and her son, meaning there's an over-identification of the self with relationships. So we know that one of Ashna's big priorities and something that she will constantly be striving for in her life you know, not necessarily a good thing, not necessarily a bad thing, but the idea that Ashna's chart is specifically telling us with that ruler in the seventh that she feels the need to complete herself via being in a relationship at all times. Um, it's, it's just a personal choice. Not everybody rolls like that, but especially when we see the ruler of the chart in the seventh, that is, that is definitely a thing, as well as all of this Sagittarius energy happening in the seventh. Um, there's just so much of this ideal of this oozingly positive relationship status. And I have to remind you, Ashna, that, you know, just because relationships might not work out, just because relationships may falter, just because relationships don't live up to your standards, because those standards are pretty high, pretty high, girl. You've, you've, set, the, you've set the bar way, way up there. Um, just because that relationship does crumble does not mean that you as a person have failed in your life. And also when you put that son in the seventh house, deriving self-esteem from your relationships can also be a little, little bit of a problem. We need you to establish a little bit more of your own footing, a little bit more of your own ground, which is really what 
this north node in cancer and the second is telling us is that first and foremost we need you to be financially stable we need you to acquire your own wealth have your own resources to dwell on instead of relying on specifically a partner in order to do that for you what else do we see we see we have jupiter and saturn both in sagittarius in the sixth house of work health and pets uh, which is being ruled by Mars in Capricorn, as well as Nor uh, South Node in Capricorn, the eighth house of death, taxes, estates. Um, working in that realm of death, taxes, estates, uh, definitely something that we see with that sixth house, eighth house connection. Um, you do very well in the legal field and the accounting fields. Um, definitely with that Scorpio energy as an editor, as an auditor, as somebody who walks in and finds the problems and is able to make them a little bit easier, a little bit more streamlined. We've got that Mars and Capricorn in the eighth. So there's this definite kind of um, this definite leadership energy that takes charge in the middle of all of those chaotic eighth house topics, which I really enjoy seeing. One of the things that you're not going to be able to do is unlock a lot of your creativity until halfway through the life, uh, which is potentially connected to the relationship stuff as well. I think one of the things that you're going to understand is as 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 you mature, uh, relationships aren't just about the connection between two people. It's actually what you can produce. Um, and in some ways, that Pluto and Libra in the fifth house of children does mean a child later in life coming from a relationship and that doesn't necessarily need to be um that doesn't necessarily need to be your own child it can be an adopted child but having a child later in life because of that fit house pluto definitely a thing but overall creativity you know creating with a partner, um, making something happen with a partner, as opposed to you thinking, oh, well, we have a relationship, box checked, the end. Uh, we need to have have a, a fruit that comes out of that, and that could be working in your partner's business, uh, that could be working um, with your partner to create some sort of art, uh, that could be many, many different things, um, specifically in the writing, teaching, speaking space, because that sun and Sag in the seventh is, is ruling that third house of writing teaching communication yes for sure what else what else do we steal um yeah i mean because you have so much packed into the seventh house ashna it's really about decoding your relationships and then separating yourself from your relationships so that you can get a stable footing financially this go around which i think is truly how you should be forming your identity based on the chart is your own wealth versus you uh, projecting this idea of everything will be fine as long as I'm in a committed long-term relationship with these super high standards that I've predefined for myself. That's the goal. So if you just keep focusing on dialing that back a little bit and opening up your possibilities, I think that's where the chart needs to succeed. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Albert, Wendy, um, uh, Jennifer. Uh, please do not post your birth details in the comments. I'm going to hide uh, all these all these things. Good morning, Carrie. Uh, so what I need you to do uh, is private message me your birth date, place, and time. Please uh, do not post those in the comments uh, because we want to respect your privacy. Okay. Um, Ashton actually sent in two charts, um, and I didn't get the name for the second chart, so we're just going to say chart number two. Um, so chart number two is 1015, also in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, and we are going to take a look at chart number two. So for chart number two, we have a Virgo ascendant at 27 degrees, making Mercury the ruler of the chart. Mercury is in that fifth house. Oh, I like that. Um, having, a, having a fifth house Mercury, there's this idea of identifying with the fifth house topics of children, of parenting, of creativity, of sexuality, all of that really creative juice that we find in the fifth house. Putting the Lord of the chart there really has an identification of I must be a parent this time around and I must do things differently. And the first thing that we're going to, to look at with that is we have Neptune in Capricorn and Mercury in Capricorn, uh, both planets that don't necessarily enjoy being in Capricorn uh, too much. Mercury prefers to be free. Mercury prefers to be all over the place. Mercury prefers to be uh, unbridled. Yeah. 
Neptune as well. Neptune is that fantasy planet. It really brings a lot of creative energy wherever it goes. But being in the constricting sign of uh, Capricorn doesn't really lend well to that creativity that it would possibly bring to the fifth house. So we find in the second chart that there is a uh, an intense need for the parenting dynamic association with children um, and, and defining one's life by the fifth house topics of parents, children, creativity, sexuality. But there is this repression that comes forward with Capricorn ruling the house. Um, and I think that there's a really interesting dynamic here because we have this naturally creative house in a very stern and cold sign. So a lot of the a lot of the disorganization, especially the the disorganization that we see in the fourth house of family in this chart with Uranus and Saturn here, you know, growing up in a house that really had very few rules that had or rules that changed day by day, and it was very difficult to to try to learn the same uh, learn new rules every other week. Um, as things were so sporadic and changing that Uranus and Sagittarius in the fourth for this person, the the big drive and the push in this chart is to actually make things um, to make things a little bit more strict, to make things a little bit more restrictive, to make sure that there is a sense of discipline and that fantasy is involved and and creativity is involved, but only at certain degrees, and that there is a a channeling, a a drive, a sustained effort towards a goal, as opposed to uh, just kind of flying by the seat of your pants and not not really getting that that constructive criticism that would be present in the fourth house, but unfortunately was not um, due to the the parenting dynamic. And I think a big thing about the the chart um, for for this person is that you have to respect that the the parents were really flying by the seat of the seat of their pants because they were working so much, honey. Um, it was it was not uh, it was not easy for them to deal with all these sixth house topics of work, health, and pets. Um, as well as hold down a family. It, it made this disruptive tendency in the chart. And because you've got that Virgo ascendant and Mercury and Capricorn ruling you, you really don't need to worry about falling into their shoes. You really don't need to worry about um, becoming them. It's not going to be a thing. In fact, you've already decided that you're going to be very, very different from a parenting perspective. Um, and there's nothing that can really change that because of the makeup of who you are. And I think that a real, one of the things that really, really qualifies you in that parenting department is this moon in Cancer in the 11th. I love to see the moon in Cancer in the 11th. It's a great, great placement because the moon is naturally at home in Cancer, giving you all of that all of those Cancerian vibes of motherly energy, maternal instincts, you know, the the idea of that that warm heart, that supportive breast, all those things that Cancer is known for, the shoulder to cry on, uh, the person who feeds you, the mom friend, you know, male or female doesn't matter, that mom friend, that maternal energy, um, in that eleventh house of friendships, and so we find that you know when it comes to friends, you're naturally going to step up and kind of be a parent to those people, but because you've got that moon in Cancer, there's always going to be that 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 leaking in of those parental resources, uh, regardless of where you're at. And I think that that fuels you a little bit as well and sets you up to be to be a great parent in general. Yeah. Um, oh, I really, mm. I mean, you could even work with families on a regular basis. You've got this, you've got the sun in Aquarius, Venus in Aquarius. They're technically no longer in Kazemi, so Venus is combust. Um, Jupiter in Aquarius on the sixth house of work being ruled by Saturn in the fourth. So working in things like family services, um, community organizations, working with um, social services, working with um, working in the family space as well, I think is is something that you would be uniquely qualified for because we've got the sixth house of work connected to the the fourth house of family. Um, and Jupiter and Saturn are in mutual reception. So there's definitely a lot of connection between what happened family-wise with you growing up and the idea of you turning that into something that you will work towards. Um, but eventually, again, like you becoming a parent is the ultimate goal. I think one of the one of the interesting parts about your chart that you may not necessarily understand yet, you may have an inkling of, but not necessarily understand, uh, is this idea of striving towards travel foreigners and higher education um, and potentially working in adoption, uh, potentially working with uh, surrogacy and or the idea of um, you actually becoming 
an instructor of some kind because we've got this north node in the ninth of, of higher learning being ruled by Venus in the sixth of work. I think that one of the things that you're uniquely qualified to do is teach other people about the experiences that you've had. Uh, and that's something that is, is stressful because we've got all of this tension in the third house of writing, teaching, communication. Your words tend to be very fierce, very sharp, very sound very manipulative and subversive because of all this Mars and Scorpio, Pluto and Scorpio South Node stuff in the third house. But if we were to transmute that and were to work on just how you've experienced the, the field that you've grown up in because of everything that happened with family, we can really start to to sprout the chart in a way that that's able to enhance the lives of others, as opposed to just working in the field and or taking on a child of your own, we can really mold that into uh, an experience that can spread the word a little bit farther, a little bit faster. Excellent. So that's a thing. Thank you so much for second chart. Uh, good morning, good morning everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, everybody who's sending me lots of messages. I appreciate you very, very much. Um, let's move on to chart number three. Chart number three is from Instagram, and it's Aliona Elena. Um, that is the handle. And we're looking at a 10.30 p.m. birth time in Ulaanbaatar. Uh, hopefully, I'm pronouncing, hopefully, I pronounced any of that right. Um, we do have a 10.30 p.m. birth time, but the ascendant is at 29 degrees, 28 seconds in. We need to be very, very specific with that birth time because it is so much on the edge. That's not something that I like to see. We just need to be really, really aware of that birth time. Otherwise, this reading is going to make no goddamn sense. Uh, do, do, do. We do have conflict between the self and... Uh, and the, the ruler of the chart, that's a little bit sticky. So we've got this Aquarius Ascendant being ruled by Saturn and Scorpio, co-present with Mars and Scorpio, both malefics in the, in the 10th house of success. And this is something that I find a lot in people who are struggling because they constantly get thrown into the spotlight, but they don't feel like they're worthy. Yeah, they would prefer to put other people in the spotlight, especially in this case, a spouse. Um, but that is not what your chart is demanding of you. Um, instead, because the ruler of your chart is in the 10th house, we find that there is a natural need for you to step up into the spotlight. There is a natural need for you to play the character that you've been assigned, as opposed to this Aquarius tendency, which would prefer to uh, escape and retreat and not deal with people. Uh, we have the Saturn and Scorpio in the 10th. You've chosen to play a very fierce role, um, not like you've chosen to play the villain, uh, which is really, really interesting. Despite this Leo moon and Venus and Leo in the seventh, which I think are lovely placements, as well as moon and Cancer in the sixth, like you've got this, you've got this heart of gold um, and it's so present in the chart, but I think one of the issues is you keep getting typecast as this bad boss bitch uh, is a good way to think about it. And I mean that like slightly negatively because we have both malefics, both hard planets in Scorpio, that subversive, dark, villainous type energy. And we know that Scorpio isn't a villain by nature, but when we have both malefics co-present in the house of success, you know, there's going to be themes throughout the life of like, you know, you being successful, technically being... Uh, being of detriment to you personally and saying, why do they keep giving me this power? I hate this power. I don't enjoy the roles that I'm being cast in is the best way to think about it. But, you know, it, it is somebody has to play the villain, honey. Somebody has to say no. And the more that you get used to this idea of you saying no personally and for other people when they can't, I think that's where your power resides in. I think that that's something that is really, really important for you to understand is you've because you have such a strong heart and because you are so connected empathetically to the people that you work with because of this moon and cancer in the sixth house of work, we have this, we have this just glorious sense of self that's so mushy and so chocolatey and so delicious, but then the personality that you've chosen to adopt, the, the, the role that you're stepping into is very fierce and very malicious and very cutting and piercing and not kind. And I think that you are uniquely qualified to play this role because you don't mean it. Um, and sometimes you do, and let's not kid ourselves from that perspective. Um, but from a, from a chart perspective, we really have so much goodness that's being wrapped in this kind of aggressive, uh, 
aggressive Scorpio Mars in the 10th package. So just be aware of that. We do have the Sun in Leo and Mercury in Leo in the seventh house. So an identification with relationships, just the love to love and be loved. Definitely part of the, the chart dynamic here. We do have a little bit of an issue in the friendship department uh, because that we have South Node, Uranus, MC, Neptune, all in Sagittarius being ruled by Jupiter in Capricorn and Jupiter is retrograde in the 12th. Um, friends are not your strong suit, honey. That is, that is something in the chart that is very much of detriment, very unpredictable, very prone to fantasy. Uh, Neptune and Uranus, as well as Jupiter, all retrograde. Uh, not, not a fan of that placement at all. In fact, getting taken advantage of friends is probably a big part of the repertoire. And I think that one of the things that this really spurs you to do is activate your North Node, this uh, Gemini North Node in the fifth house of creativity, children, parenting, um, this North Node, especially because it's being ruled by a Mercury in Virgo, the sign of its exaltation in the eighth house of uh, death, taxes, estates, business. I think that one of the things that you can uh, really, really understand about where you're headed is to be is to be productive and constructive in ways that somewhat isolate you, that somewhat put you in the shadows uh, to recover, to heal, to withdraw, as opposed to trying to seek that extroverted tendency, because you're not going to find any healing through that. We have this Leo sun, this Venus Leo, but they're personal. They're in the seventh house of relationships. They're they're about connecting with with another person. They're not necessarily about connecting with groups of people. And because of that, it's not necessarily beneficial for you uh, in your chart to, to reach into that 11th house. That's where resources get compromised. So I would much rather see you recharge after a day of biting people at the heels um, and enforcing your power as your ruler of the chart, co-present with Mars dictates in the 10th. Um, I'd rather see you cuddling up on the couch with like some nice, uh, some nice ice cream, some wine, a blanket, a lover, um, and just enjoying that Cancer Moon placement, enjoying this Venus and Leo, uh, putting on a funny movie and getting some of the more retreating aspects that force you to focus on yourself and ask yourself the tough questions, as opposed to leaning on the 11th house, because that's what you're supposed to do as a Leo is you're supposed to be fun and you're supposed to be energetic and you're supposed to be all these things where really it's it's just going to get you into trouble, honey. It, it really is. So the more that you understand your role as the villain, as typecast, you're very, very good at it. You're the perfect person to play it because of all of this emotional gushiness. But this emotional gushiness gets taken advantage of by friends, which is why you should just retreat, stay at home, grab a lover, grab a movie, grab some popcorn, grab some chocolate wine, whatever suits your fancy, and just bundle up like a big old burrito and chill. That's that's my two cents for you and and your chart. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, everybody who's jumping on. I appreciate you so very much for supporting my live stream. Um, we are on chart number four. Uh, do, 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 and we are looking at uh, the Instagram handle who was not able to give me a name. Uh, I'll just spell it out. S-E-X-W-I-T-V-H. Um, not really sure how to pronounce that. I just know that there's sex in it because I'm Scorpio rising. Um, but when we look at the birth time, we have 4.57 p.m. in Shell Harbor. Uh, so let's take a let's take a quick peek at this chart. We've got a Taurus ascendant ruled by uh, ruled by Venus and Capricorn up in the ninth, which automatically makes this person very much associated with the ninth house topics of travel, foreigners, higher learning, spirituality. But there is a strictness here. We've already talked about the idea of Venus and Capricorn, Neptune and Capricorn. She's also got Uranus and Capricorn in the ninth house. There's this really big ninth house energy, but it's restricted in Capricorn. Like she's telling herself no way too often. She's trying to bundle all of these unpredictable topics and control the uncontrollable. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if she did go to college and she's like, um, I don't know what I'm supposed to major in because I'm really good at all these things. Honey, you're not good at all these things. You just put in more work. Yes, you are a workhorse, a workhorse. 
Uh, and that's something that you need to understand about your chart is yes, hard work will get you a lot of places, but you are naturally talented in certain things, specifically studying, note taking, the idea of memorizing facts about foreign cultures. Um, uh, your affiliation with travel also gives you a, a cultured perspective, even if you haven't physically traveled. Uh, you've got all of these talents which make you very good in the scholastic environment, but that does not mean that you are technically good at everything. You are good at ninth house topics specifically. Travel, higher education, foreigners. That's that's where your skill set lies. And I think it's because you incorporate this hardworking sign of Capricorn that you really, really get into the juice of it. And I absolutely love about your chart, honey, this idea of Saturn in Aquarius, very, very close to the, the midheaven. Uh, midheaven's at 10 degrees, Saturn's at 13 degrees, up in that 10th house of success. That's a success placement. However, we know this about Saturn. Saturn tends to mature around year 30 and really doesn't come to blossom until 60. So we have this issue in the chart about you not really getting settled into your own skin until 30, until that Saturn return, which is going to happen next year, um, depending. I, I'm not not really sure about that 13 degree Saturn when that goes exact. But when we look at you struggling in that scholastic environment and really trying to perform and really trying to make do, you know, we really look to this, this Jupiter and Libra down in the sixth to talk about like, and it's making an exact trying to that Saturn and Aquarius. Oh, that midheaven girl, girl, I am so pleased with your workhorse tendencies. You are just so good at keeping your head down and doing the work. I love this position in your chart. I absolutely love it. All of this earth and air energy, just so perfectly balanced. It's it's wonderful, absolutely lovely. Um, but you are good at working. You are not good at the individual topics that you work at. Again, we want to stay in your own wheelhouse, but that hard work ethic and that ability to just keep your head down and really focus, that's your saving grace. That's that's why you feel so good at so many things because this Jupiter in Libra, just so good and so pleasing and so energetic and so personal. Um, like you'd be a great receptionist um, if you didn't have such a, such a, overachieving work ethic. Um, you can't stay superficial for long, but that Jupiter and Libra in the sixth definitely allows you to be, uh, to crack that smile and, and win some hearts with that. Um, but en enough about that. We've, we've talked about your strengths enough. We need to talk about some weaknesses. Um, yeah, first and foremost, talking to people relationship wise, that's difficult. We've got this Mars and Cancer totally afflicted retrograde uh, in the sign of its in the sign of its fall, making a sign base trying to not just Mercury and Scorpio, but Pluto and Scorpio uh, and Mars ruling that chart in the seventh house. So talking to people relationship wise, something that you're going to need to get better at eventually, because if you if you want if you want somebody in your life, you're going to need to tell them. Yeah, that's going to have to be a thing at some point. Just giving you, just giving you my two cents on the, on the matter. Um, but we're going to have somebody in your life who's naturally as, um, who's naturally going to be slightly secretive, who's naturally going to be very profiling, who's naturally going to be very dark and mysterious and, and handsome, um, especially halfway through the life when that Pluto and Scorpio matures. But we need to get over these communication blocks. Uh, I think one of the reasons why you have to work so hard is potentially there's dyslexia in the chart. There's this issue with communication, could be a stutter, but we have this Mars and Cancer retrograde. Mars, a fire planet and a water sign, never a good thing. But the fact that it's going retrograde, it's like the idea that the words want to come out so bad, but every time that they come out, they just get jumbled and twisted and, and come out backwards. So that's that's one thing that we're going to need to work steadily, work slowly, which you definitely have in the chart. And that's how you overcome it is just, again, by keeping your head down and doing twice the work for half the price. Um, but that's that's kind of what you need to do in order to get that Mars out of the third. Um, we also have this, we also have this really, really resentful placement. Yeah, there's some deep resentment. Ooh, especially when it comes to siblings. Third house is also on a nuanced meaning related to siblings. Uh, Mars and the moon are in mutual reception. Moon is in Aries in the 12th house of hidden enemies. Mars, we've already talked about, worst place it could possibly be. 
Uh, so the idea that the two are connected means that siblings are going to turn into hidden enemies. Your community will turn against you. Uh, the idea of you harboring some very, very deep emotional resentment for this, these third house topics of writing, teaching, communication, siblings, your neighbors, that kind of thing. Uh, we need to work on that, honey. That's that's also what's fueling a lot of the a lot of the speech writing communication issues is that you have so much heat inside of you emotionally that it it tries to come out all at once and it's literally so hot that it it makes the tongue wag in weird ways um, and it makes your your verbal um, onslaught that you would like to give somebody very very unfocused and you end up getting even more frustrated so we need to work with that a little bit. Um, that 12th house, third house, definitely something to be aware of. Okay, I think that's pretty much it with this chart. Uh, we've covered a lot of, a lot of, oh no, we didn't cover the sun in the eighth. Um, sun in the eighth, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a fan of sun in Sagittarius in the eighth. Not really. Um, it does give you a good boost of personality. It also makes you slightly esoteric. Uh, very driven, very entrepreneurial, very business oriented. Um, and in fact, starting your own business, something I would recommend because we've got Jupiter and Libra as well as uh, the North Node in Sagittarius and Sun in Sagittarius ruled by that. Um, you'd be a great entrepreneur um, because again, you can just hustle. Uh, I would highly suggest if you don't already follow Gary V. Uh, that is that is an excellent mentor for you to have who just talks about hustle and compassion all the time um, and can also help you get over some self-esteem stuff. So that is chart number four. Um, hello, everybody jumping on. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, we're at chart four out of eight. We're doing eight charts every morning for those of you who have not been following the Astro Babble live stream. Um, yeah, so this is just kind of a break where I talk about, yeah, if you'd like to schedule a consult, if you'd like some online classes, just go to scorpiorisingastrology.com. If you would like to add it to the queue, send me your birth date, place, and exact birth time, and um, I will add you to the queue. It's long, but I will add you to the queue. Okay, let's work on chart number five. We have uh, Livy. Livy was born, forgive me for if that is mispronounced, we have 8.06 p.m. in Longview. Let's take a look. Scorpio rising, woo! Um, Scorpio rising ruled by Mars and Sag in the seventh. Interesting, right on the cusp, as well as Moon and Sag, Pluto and Sag. Pluto and Sag is retrograde. That's really interesting. We've got some heavy financial, heavy financial markers in the chart. Ooh, ooh, all this finance. Get me all worked up. Goodness gracious. Yeah, that's absolutely crazy. So we've got this Pluto, Moon, and... Uh, Mars, all in the second house of finance, opposing Saturn and Gemini, Mercury, Gemini, Jupiter, Gemini, all in the eighth house of business, death, tax, estates, all that jazz. So I think one of the things that we're going to need to remediate, first and foremost, is your wallet, honey, darling, boo boo. Um, but because we have the ruler of the chart in the financial house, that does give you a good predilection for finance. It does uh, pull you towards the curiosity of money. Having Gemini, uh, Mercury and Gemini in the eighth, also very, very intuitive, but also very, very um, financially aware and financially interested sign. We have Jupiter and Gemini here too, which is a great sign for investment. Um, Saturn and Gemini kind of counterbalances that just a little bit, but Saturn is also very prudish and good long term. So I enjoy that placement, not as bad, especially because it's being ruled by Mercury as the Lord of that house. And you've got Mercury and Gemini ruling the 11th house of friendships, um, which is, which is always really, really nice to see investors, people who are willing to come to your aid, very, very easy for you to acquire. Um, nice. I would highly, highly recommend you get into investment banking um, and or accounting, something to do with finances because you've really stacked your chart on that axis of that second house of personal wealth, finance, and that eighth axis of other people's money, business, and, and estates. Um, that's interesting. But what we're really working towards is that north node in the third of writing, teaching, communication. Um, and potentially building communities. Yeah, hmm, fun. 
one of the areas that you might find really, really fun is uh, building uh, real estate investments, building multifamily homes, um, working with investors who are uh, cash pooling in order to go into those investments. So you're able to put like a certain percentage down in order, in order to buy in kind of like a poker game. And then as the building develops and as the finances start to roll in, you then get that same percentage back over time as one of the early investors in these kind of like hundred condo unit buildings. That might be a really fun place for you to play with, um, with your financial stuff. Yep, working in the financial field, Mars and Sagittarius, um, ruling the sixth house of work. We've got Venus and Aries, which is a detrimental placement. So there's this love-hate relationship. There's this potentially overly aggressive feminine energy that comes into the sixth house. So there might be this, this boss who's always haunting, who's always hounding you, um, especially a female boss um, who's constantly down your throat about stuff, especially money. Um, I get it. Uh, but because this sun is in Taurus in the seventh, I think we need to respect the idea that you're just a total softy, um, especially when it comes to your relationships. Your relationships are your weakness. Um, not necessarily a bad thing, but also finding your bow through your work. Uh, because we've got that Venus and Aries ruling that seventh house of relationships. It does bring you into a little bit of a, a pickle because you you love that 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 Taurus sun in the seventh really does just want to love love. However, that Venus and Aries ruling it does say, huh, if you want my love, you're going to have to jump this high. Must be this must be this uh, invested, must be this um, growth seeking, must be this self-development oriented, must be this competitive in order to ride this ride. Uh, and that's that's not necessarily ideal, but it is how you've chosen to to put your placements. Do, do, do. Um, investing also seems like it might be a family business because that uh, that Saturn in Gemini in the eighth is ruling Neptune and Uranus down in the fourth, which is fun. And uh, potentially a famous spouse because we've got that Sun in Taurus ruling that MC up in uh, up in the the tenth. Cool. Yeah, I think that's it about this chart. Thank you so much, uh, Livy, for donating your chart to science. Um, three more charts to go. Let's talk about Miss Sangeeta. Sangeeta. Uh, we've got 4.25 p.m. in Slough. I think I pronounced that right. Let's see. Uh, we've got Aquarius Ascendant with Jupiter and Aquarius in the first house. Big Aquarius energy here. Um, Jupiter Jupiter makes anything big. So when we see Jupiter in the first house of of personality, there's this idea of the personality being just a little bit extra, but in an Aquarius way. So Aquarius tends to be just a little bit zany, a little bit aloof, a little bit isolating. Um, it is the sign of the genius. I do find Aquarians to be very smart, very mental beings, but their their thoughts are often in outer space is a good way to, to say it. But it also makes them fun and interesting from that dynamic. Where's the ruler of your chart? Ruler of your chart is in the sixth house of work. So we have Boom, boom, Sangeeta, you're a workaholic. That's always fun. Um, and I'm one to talk because the ruler of my chart is in the exact same place, and I feel you, girl. It's tough because you want to be productive all the goddamn time. You just do. It's a thing. And I'm re I'm totally here for it. The issue, though, is that we have this Saturn and Cancer in the sixth, and that's actually going to be a detriment. So there's much more of a tendency for you to burn out if you don't activate this moon in Gemini and light up your Mercury in Scorpio. So let's talk about how you do that. You know, with this big personality, you think that you can go for miles, and I totally think that you can, and that work ethic is definitely there, but the energy reserves might not be. So one of the ways that you need to understand your chart, Sangeeta, is to actually activate this moon in Gemini in the fifth. That fifth house of creativity, that fifth house of parenting, of children, we need to activate that emotional pull, that creative energy to then pull vault you into success. Because without that moon, without that emotional hint, you know, you can't keep your nose to the grindstone forever. You're not going to be able to, um, to 
just go, 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 go. Like some people, you need these emotional refresh breaks almost more than most people. Uh, so if we activate these fifth house topics of creativity and we, we really weave that into the workplace in order to get you off of this high horse of thinking that you need to do everything for everyone all at once all the time, then that's going to be extremely valuable for you to master uh, in this go around. So yeah, let's see, what else? What else, what else, what else? We've got this sun in Libra, Uranus in Libra, Pluto in Libra, all in the ninth house of uh, higher education travel foreigners, being ruled by Venus and Sag, Neptune and Sag, and the 11th house of friendships, as well as MC and Sag. I like this, Sangeeta, I like this a lot. I think that one of one of the other things that can pull you out of a funk is friendships. I think that there's a big connection here. I think that um, if you allow some of your friends to be distracting, I think if you allow some of your friendship connections and your group resources to pull you out of that afflicted sixth house work health pets thing, I think you're really going to start to blossom your chart. Uh, because those those people that you choose to have in your circle, you know, they're Neptune and Venus and Sag. They're super fun. They're super eclectic. They're super uh, fantasy oriented. They're very creative individuals. And that type of creativity is what you need in your life, girl, let me tell you. Um, and we have the midheaven here. So friendships are, have always been and will always be very, very important to you. Um, and a lot of the friends that you meet will actually be uh, in in the realms of travel, foreigners, higher education. And that's going to be a big part of, uh, of where you meet some of those contacts, especially later in life as you get some of the financial resource stuff down to travel. Uh, we're going to find... Um, we're going to find a good a good gripping of those kind of international connections, which are actually going to help you uh, do a lot of fun stuff. Like work on fellowships, exchange programs, that kind of thing. Because Jupiter is ruling the second house of finance from the first house, there is an identification with money uh, and wealth. I think that that's, I think that that's important but I think that it also feeds into the workaholic energy. I think that there is a sense of this, this need to perform, this need to make money in order to feel satiated, but what's really going to satiate the chart are these creative houses, these travel houses, these higher learning houses. That's where we're going to find the soul growth that we need, as opposed to just, again, showing up to a job and working in order to make coin to put in the bank. Uh, we, we have different priorities in the chart for sure. And I think growing up in a creative household, um, especially with that, that Mars and Taurus, although it is retrograde, um, that Mars and Taurus is ruling the third house of writing, teaching, communication. You know, growing up with access to the arts is definitely always a boon for people who need a lot of creativity in the chart. And I think that healing, um, healing the self specifically via those medium, uh, those, those arts, uh, really, really going to be very, very helpful for you to understand. You know, it's not it's not how hard you work, it's the impact you make, Sangeetha. Okay, so that's that chart. Thank you so much, everybody, for jumping on and sending me all these messages that I'm now having to close. I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, so now we've got two charts left, two charts left. Again, if you would like to submit yours, feel free to send your birth date, place, and exact birth time. I do need that exact birth time. If you don't have that exact birth time, I can't put you in the queue and we will add you to the queue. Only private message me. Do not send that in the in the comments. Ooh, Sag Stellium. Neptune and Sag seems to be a theme today, but Sag Stellium in the first house. Um, with the sun and Scorpio in the 12th, gross. Okay, uh, we have Jennifer. Jennifer, uh, sorry, Jennifer was born at 8.02 a.m. in Pueblo. Uh, let's take a look. Not a fan, not a fan of this conflicting energy, Jennifer. Not a fan. Um, oh, but you're so spiritual. Oh, but you use it as a crutch. Um, where do we go from here? Yeah, so we've got we've got this Sagittarius stellium bringing all of this lighthearted, fun, positive toxically positive 
uh, way, way, way too positive, white picket fence is not real, holy grail is a farce, kind of positive energy into that first house of self. And then we have Venus and Scorpio retrograde, the worst possible position for a Venus. Um, Uranus and Scorpio and Sun and Scorpio in the 12th house of hidden enemies, karmic healing, uh, hospitalizations, etc. So we've got some real self-esteem issues for Jennifer, uh, which I don't like to see in the chart at all, especially paired with this escapism tendency uh, from the first house. And like I said, the crutch of spirituality from this Pisces moon conjunct the south node in the fourth house. Um, I know that a lot of these habits are inherited, Jennifer, and I know that there's a lot of karmic healing that needs to be done in your lineage. I know that there's a lot of stuff that needs to be rectified from the family. I know that there's a bunch of just really, really sloppy emotional boundary like BS that that's going to need to be worked through in the chart. Like I get it, honey. It's not it's not your fault totally but we need to work with these complacements just to, we need to work with these placements a little bit more constructively uh first and foremost is not fighting uh your time to shine in the spotlight as an editor as somebody who comes in uh especially from a business standpoint and is able to determine uh what is needed what is not needed um somebody who is able to say no when other people cannot say no somebody who is able to um somebody who is able to walk onto the scene and create a sense of clarity where clarity did not exist. Um, yes, your positive spin does help, but there is this business side to you that I think needs to be embraced. It's not all, it's not all dark and shadow, although that's a big part of your life, but it's also not the other end of the extreme. We can't, we can't go from one end to the other here, Jennifer. We have to be able to bridge somewhere in the middle. And I think that this 10th house North node, this MC, this Saturn and Virgo up in the 10th really brings a lot of great constructive energy into the chart, but you're missing it if you're, if you're not, if you're not reaching for that, those management positions, those editor positions, those positions that really allow you to access your ability to, to cut, to sever, to organize, to manage. If you're not, and this is, you know, this is something that I talk a lot about with my clients who have similar placements because of the self-esteem issues, because of all of the, um, the craziness that's happening in the chart that seems so unmanageable. Why me? Yeah. Why am I the one who, who people turn to in order to get their life back in order? Why am I the one who should call myself a manager when I can't manage my own stuff? You know, that's a really good question, but the question has a very simple answer. Just because you're bad at managing your own stuff does not mean that you're bad at managing other people. And in fact, because you've spotted all of your own mistakes so many times, it's very easy for you to sit down with somebody and say, hey, look, I've been there. It's tough, but this is what we need to do about it. And I'm going to take the authoritative role and everything's going to be fine because we have a system, we have a process, we have a step-by-step -step manual in order to get there. We're going to do things by the book this time around, and that's going to keep you safe and well. Yeah. Instead of your natural fly by the seat of your pants until all your clothes come off, um, uh, all of this Sagittarius energy in the first house is really, really spunky, is really, really fiery, is really, really intense and escapist. Um, and we've got all of this healing that needs to be done in the fourth house and the 12th house. But the way that we start to piece it all together is by really sinking into that, that 10th house of success, really working on helping people sort out their own problems, really working on stepping up to the plate for other people when they can't step up to the plate for themselves and giving them a process, a plan, a formula in order to work through their own garbage because that's something that you've had to do and therefore are uniquely qualified to do for others. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So... We've got this. We've got this Jupiter and Leo too in the ninth house. I'm not sure how I feel about that. How do I feel about that? So Jupiter in the ninth house in Leo. I mean, that's a big old Jupiter. It's a big old Jupiter. Um, you attract really fun college professors. That's one thing I can say about that. You tend to meet really interesting people when you travel. Um, but there is a hidden enemy component because that ninth house is ruled by that Scorpio in the twelfth. Um, on a higher expression, that would be pilgriming, uh, going on pilgrimage to spiritual sites in order to facilitate healing. On a lower level, again, that's like when you travel, 
uh, you tend to be an easy target for people to pickpocket. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think the chart is coughing up dry, uh, but we've we've covered so much. It's just like we would really need to get into those emotional themes one on one. Um, and I'm sure that you have a bunch of questions, Jennifer. So if you would like to schedule a private consult, we can definitely go into these details a little bit more. Um, thank you, Sandy, smiling and waving. Uh, we've got one more chart to do, and then we will wrap up for today. Um, I'm so sorry if I pronounced this wrong, Nyla. Um, so Nyla was born 11.14 a.m. in Columbus. Uh, let's take a look at this chart. Ooh, ooh, Virgo. I'm a big fan. So we've got this Ascendant in Virgo, Pluto in Virgo, and the South Node in Virgo, all in the first house of self. Being ruled by Mercury in Cancer, Sun in Cancer, Mars in Cancer, ooh, up in the 11th. An identification with friendships, social groups, um, as well as like community activities, uh, charities, humanitarian efforts, definitely something that we see uh, with the Lord up the first in the 11th. Uh, Sun and Cancer, like, honey, you're just, you're just a big old mama bear. That's who you are. You just want to protect people. You just want to save people. You just want to make sure that they, they got their blankets and they got their food and they got their nightlight and they're, that they're safe and loved and warmed and, and cuddly. Yeah, that's, that's really a big purpose in your chart, um, especially saving the victim because we've got this Venus and Leo um, in the 12th house of, of hidden enemies being ruled by the sun in, uh, in Cancer. Yeah, so you really, you've really just got this um, you've really just got this rescuer complex. Um, if you have not seen the Disney movie, The Rescuers, I highly recommend because it seems like you are definitely uh, the girl mouse from The Rescuers. That's that's totally that's totally who you are. Um, and yes, I always make Disney references with my clients. Um, then we have oh, we have this Moon in Libra. This moon in Libra, Uranus in Libra, Jupiter in Libra, all in the second house of finance. I enjoy this. I enjoy this um, This moon in Libra. I enjoy this Jupiter in Libra. Don't necessarily enjoy this Uranus in Libra. I don't like to see Uranus in the second house. Uranus is all about unpredictability. It's about dishevelment. It's about natural disaster. And we don't like to see that in the second house of finance. <laughs> we just don't like to see that. It's it's not a thing. It's not, it should not be there. Um, but because we've got Jupiter in Libra and the moon in Libra, um, there's a little bit of remediation, but the ruler is in the 12th house of hidden enemies. So finance does tend to be a big issue. Unfortunately, your heart can really overgive, but your your wallet and your time and your energy cannot. Um, so we need to find a little bit more of an efficient way to take care of people. Show people you care with not without breaking the bank. Honey, that's, that's a big lesson that you're going to need to learn. Um, college also tends to be really tricky for you. That higher education, travel, foreigners, that ninth house has Saturn in it. Um, and it's being ruled by that Venus in the 12th. So those hidden enemies of... Uh, Hidden enemies we tend to find in that ninth house topic of travel, foreigners, higher education. That's tricky, tricky, tricky. Um, but you do really good, like working in a uh, working in travel, working in higher education, working with foreigners. That would be a good. That'd be good. Oh, yeah. You'd actually be really good at working with foreigners, especially working for like an immigration attorney. You'd be really good at that. Um, yeah, you'd be totally good at that. Because again, like you just want to rescue people. You just want to help people out of their out of their detrimental situations. And there's nobody better for that than, you know, uh, somebody somebody working as an uh, as a as an immigration attorney with this this Mars and Cancer ruling the eighth house. Um, and then Saturn and Taurus uh, ruling the sixth, like you'd be very, very good working with immigration. For sure. Really interesting. Um, but the goal here is to actually have a, a really strong relationship. And I think that this is this is where this is where the boundary issues start to come in with the the taking care of everybody, because you think you think or you thought that your spouse is going to be somebody that you have to take care of, right? Am I right? Surprise, 
spouses can take care of themselves. It is a thing. It has been known to happen in the wild. Um, so when we look at your chart specifically, this North Node in Pisces ruled by that Jupiter Libra and the second of wealth, I think that one of the things that you should be looking for in a partner um, is that they are sustainable, that they do not need you in any way, shape, or form, especially financially, uh, in order to survive, in order to thrive. They are self-sufficient. Um, and because you attract a partner who is naturally self-sufficient, uh, there's going to be this kind of dropping of your guard, dropping of your, your tendencies, your stories that you have to come to the rescue, especially of the most important person in your life that seventh house relationship, there's going to be this idea of, hey, you know, I, I don't need you. I want you in my life, but I don't need you in my life. And although that sounds kind of cool and somewhat distancing for a partner to say, it's exactly the medicine that you need because of this over rescuing quality that you've demonstrated throughout the life. We need a partner who's going to be able to say, look, I'm all about intimacy and being like, really close to you and understanding, you know, doing all the things that couples do. But at the end of the day, like, I don't need you to reach into your wallet to pay for dinner. I've got it. I don't need you to sign off on the mortgage because your credit is better. I got it. I don't need you to, um, to co-sign this loan. I don't need you to do all these things financially, time-wise, energy-wise. I've, I've got it. Yeah, I am, I am okay without you. And that's just going to be a really healthy part of the chart that I think needs to be unpacked. Uh, but because we have Pluto in the first house, just remember that that's going to naturally attract you to the occult. That's naturally going to attract you to the underworld energies of Pluto, um, delving into the mysteries, delving into the shadow self, delving into the subconscious, delving into all those um, Plutonian mysteries. Uh, really, really fun stuff. But a side effect of having Pluto in the first house is we don't really feel like our life begins until halfway through uh, around 50. So I think that also works in your favor with the partner too, because by 50, you know, somebody's somebody's already got their got their stuff together. It's just going to be difficult in the life when you feel like your relationships are just one more friendship that you have to rescue. Because again, ruler of the chart in the friendship house, you're all about the friendships, but those friendships tend to need to, you know, be rescued. You're not you're not about the business of collecting stray animals in your life, honey. Eventually those animals need to be released and take care of themselves. So just as a just as an FYI, um, you are Wonder Woman, but you don't need to be. Okay. So there's your medicine for the day. Uh, thank you so much for all of these lovely messages. I appreciate you. Um, if you would like to be a part of the queue for these live streams, these Astro Babel live streams, I just need your birth date, birth place, and exact birth time. And uh, private message me those. Do not post those in the comments. And I will add you to the queue. The list is long, but I will message you the morning your chart is featured. Um, and if you would like to book a private consult, I am accepting new clients. You can go to scorpiorisingastrology.com and check out my consultation offerings, check out the online classes that I have, support me by buying a class, or if you liked today's reading, send me uh, PayPal stuff, sam at scorpiorisingastrology.com. And uh, yeah, we'll keep doing this every morning. I appreciate everybody jumping along. And um, in the meantime, may the stars be ever in your favor.